what are the real questions. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the sponsoring organizations for this event. We'll have a word from uh, Live Move, uh, and then I'll introduce Mr. Walker. First, I want to advise you that this is being uh, broadcast through the U of O channel and website, and will be available for download later after the event. The Sustainable Cities Initiative is an organization created here at the University of Oregon through the leadership of faculty, including Professor Nico Larco, who's here in the front. Raise your hand, please, Nico. Mark Schlossberg, Robert Young, and others. And the idea behind the Sustainable Cities Initiative is to bring together the creativity and energy of students, the research capacity of faculty, combine them to advance the sustainability of cities in Oregon, in the United States, and around the world. The programs offered by Sustainable Cities Initiative are the Sustainable City Year program, and I believe several of you here are enrolled in one or more of those classes. Is that true? Can I see your hands? Several of you? You might think about that when you're thinking about next year's courses, if you would like to participate in a Sustainable City Year course, because it allows you to take what you're learning and apply it directly to a real community uh, and prepare uh, yourself professionally for what work will be like outside the university while achieving some great things for the community today. Uh, another program, and I should add that the Sustainable City Year program, which has won national awards, involves about four to 500 students a year working with the city. Next year it'll be with two or three uh, prior partner cities. And it's really an unprecedented scale of this kind of engagement of um, the world of academe and the world of practice and an ability to learn something uh, and to contribute something. So I urge you to learn more about the Sustainable City Year program. Another program is this one, the Expert in Residence program, which is made possible through generous support by some donors to the University of Oregon Foundation uh, with the uh, partnership of the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium and in cooperation with LiveMove. And you'll hear a little bit more about LiveMove, a student organization, in a moment. Last year, the expert in residence was Gabe Klein, who was just leaving his position as Director of Transportation for the City of Washington, D.C. Uh, and between the time he left that position and the time he came to the University of Oregon, he was appointed by the new mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, to direct transportation in Chicago. We also have a Scholars in Residence program. Mr. Peng Tong, who's here with us tonight, is from the Chengdu Institute of Planning and Design in Sichuan in China. Next fall, we'll have Joan Fitzgerald, who's a professor at Northeastern University and the author of Emerald Cities as a Scholar in Residence. We do some international work in partnership with planning and design institutions uh, in China, and there will be some opportunities for students in architecture, landscape architecture and planning to have an internship um, with a planning design institute in China. And of course, faculty affiliated with the Sustainable Cities Initiative are engaged in a wide spectrum of research uh, that's aimed to provide real practical assistance for communities trying to achieve sustainable outcomes. I think now would be a good time to hear from Casey Giverts from LibMove. Casey? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's event with Jarrett Walker. I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, my name is Casey Gifford, and I am the coordinator for Live Move Speaker Series. Live Move was pleased to work with the Sustainable Cities Initiative in bringing you tonight's speaker. Um, thank you especially to Lauren Schwartz um, for all her coordination. Live Move is the Transportation and Livability Student Group at the University of Oregon. Our mission is to promote healthy, sustainable communities by integrating transportation and livability through collaboration, education, research, and outreach. LiveMove is supported by the generous donations of the City of Eugene, the City of Springfield, Lane Transit District, and Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium. So can we give them a big thank you, please? <laughs> Let me thank, uh, second the thanks to Lauren Schwartz, who's in the back, who is one of the graduate teaching fellows at the Sustainable Cities Initiative. In addition to the program tonight, she's organized Mr. Walker's entire itinerary, which includes appearances um, today, tomorrow in Portland, uh, and a workshop um, that was held earlier today that was, I think, really uh, fascinating. Some of you participated in that workshop. 
Jarrett Walker is an international consultant in public transit network design and policy. He's been a full-time consultant since 1991 and has led numerous major planning projects in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Currently serves as principal consultant with MR Cagney based in Australia. He provides expert advice to clients worldwide. He was born in Portland in 1962 during the revolutionary 1970s. Seemed a lot tamer in my memory, Jarrett, but anyway. An era when Portland made, first made its decisive commitment to be a city for people other than cars. In fact, I will say that uh, we live in a house in a neighborhood uh, which was going to have a big freeway going through it, and our house would have been on the bark dust covered slope leading to the outer lanes. So things did change pretty dramatically, and I know that influenced many people from our generation. He went on to complete a BA at Pomona College, Claremont, California, and a PhD in Theater Arts and Humanities at Stanford University passionately interested in an impractical number of fields, is probably the only person with peer-reviewed publications in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. In addition to human transit, he also writes on botany, creative writing, performing arts, and a range of other interests on his personal blog, Creature of the Shade. He's going to speak for about 45 minutes. We'll have some time for questions and answers, and we ask that he use the microphones at the front of the auditorium and then he's available to sign books. Finally, let me say, and I should have mentioned this earlier, if you'd like to learn more about Sustainable Cities Initiative, the website is sci at uoregon.edu. Please welcome Jarrett Walker. Thank you very much, Robert, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I've been working on public transit planning for about 20 years, and because I have this literature background, I tend to be the person who notices, um, who sort of digs, looks underneath the conversation that's happening and tries to figure out the conversation that's really happening. You know, like you do when you're studying a literary text, you know something's going on, but you also know that something's really going on, and you're, also, you're always trying to figure out what that is. One of the things that I always notice when we're talking about public transit is that there seems to be um, more of a consensus about, uh, there seem to be a lot more answers than questions. Um, that often when two people are talking past each other, they're actually, and seem to be disagreeing, what they actually have are answers to different questions. And that, the, and that it's the, our, our inability to sort of come together on what the question is about public transit. What is it that we're really doing? Um, that is actually a sort of unique problem, I think, in this field. Um, what is the transit question? Now, if you follow journalism very much, and if you follow popular writing about public transit, you could be forgiven for assuming that this is the question. That what's interesting about public transit is um, that, the, that the great public transit choice is about picking a vehicle and picking a technology, right? So, you know, buses versus streetcars, or um, uh, bus rapid transit versus light rail, and what about driverless metro, and what about monorails, and um, every few, ever, since I've been writing this blog, now every couple of days, I'll get an email from someone who tells me he has the answer to our transportation problem. And the answer is almost always a technology, and I almost always have to disappoint him because I have to write back and say, you know, the question is actually a little more complicated than the question that you're asking. The interesting thing about the focus on choosing vehicles and technologies, which is almost um, universal uh, in this business, although I think in many ways Eugene Springfield struggles with this less than a lot of other places because you have a clear commitment to MX. Um, it's easy because everybody has an emotional reaction to a vehicle. Um, it's kind of a false analogy with the process of choosing personal vehicles. You know, we all have, we, you know, most of us have had the experience of purchasing some kind of personal vehicle, whether it's a car or a bicycle or something else, and having made those decisions about sort of practicality versus look and feel versus how you feel riding this thing or, or driving this thing and so on. Um, but the process of choosing vehicles uh, is, is not like that really in public transit um, because it's, first of all, it's, you know, it's, it's important that, that, a, that a public transit network work together in a particular way um, and, it's, um, and the vehicle choice is often um, one that can get sort of way out of control. And we sometimes see situations 
where a proposal is made by people who are so enamored of a particular vehicle that they almost don't really care where it goes, or, or that the whole process of how it gets fit into a network is secondary, and there's this assumption that once we've chosen the wonderful vehicle, those little engineers will go off and figure out how to make it work. And that's, that actually doesn't work that way. Um, but the most interesting thing that we always have to come back to when we're interacting with vehicle love is that when you're saying, let's, let's choose a more expensive technology rather than a, a, a cheaper technology, um, you're basically saying that you th not just that people like this technology, that's never the question. I, um, I don't, I'm not interested in whether people like streetcars. What I'm interested in is whether people like streetcars more than they like getting where they're going. Because that's the actual trade-off when you choose a more expensive uh, technology which you can therefore afford less of, right? Um, it tends to trade off against the sheer abundance of the network. And we'll come back to that again. So there's this basic issue about, and you'll encounter this all the time in transit work, um, is the technology a goal? In which case the thought process is something like, what a great vehicle, where should we run it? Uh, the Portland street car, uh, city of Portland did a streetcar network system study about four years ago, and that was really the scope. The scope was, we love streetcars, and so we study the whole city and figure out where to put them. Um, the opposite way of approaching it, of course, is what kind of service or capacity do we need to, to serve transit's essential task? And then it's like, then we, we, we choose the tool that Press provides that. It's very much like walking through a store and letting things that you see excite you, as opposed to walking into the store with a shopping list and staying somewhat focused on that. It's almost exactly analogous to that. But we come down to this interesting question, which is what is transit's essential task? And this turns out to be a rather difficult question. First of all, what do I mean by essential task? Well, what's the essential task of the police? Um, policing builds confidence in the city as a place to invest and a place to live. Um, police participate in um, community programs, fundraising for good causes. This is something that police do. Obviously, police have an essential role in our economy in that they provide dramatic content for film, television, and video. That's a very important thing, poli thing police do. And yet, we, and yet, and you know, if you're a 10-year-old boy, you might even say that the sirens make the city sound more exciting. But what's missing there, and what we all know, is that those are all side effects or secondary aspects of policing, and that the police have a very clear essential task, which is called law enforcement, and that we understand that that's what distinguishes them from a lot of other people who may be out on the street doing good things. So, and one of the reasons why the police often win arguments with a lot of other municipal functions where their needs come into conflict is precisely that the police are so clear about what their job is, and everyone else is so clear about what their job is too. But when we bring that around to transit, it turns out to be very hard. Uh, a, few week, a few months ago, I had a chance to, I, I, I had a chance to have a private dinner with a bunch of um, fairly imp, uh, leading urban uh, thinkers, transport thinkers, uh, both academics and practitioners in Vancouver, BC. And I asked them, what, on analogy to the notion that the essential task of the police is law enforcement, uh, defining essential task by that analogy, what's the essential task of transit? What is the thing that transit actually goes out and does every day that produces the various outcomes that we want from it? And they were all over the map. Economic growth with less congestion. Social justice, social inclusion, meeting needs, environmental outcomes, support, support for sustainable urban form. Someone even mentioned fun. And there is, in fact, um, now two books by a gentleman by the name of Darren Nordahl, whose thesis is that the only thing that's wrong with public transit in America is that it's not more fun. So <clears throat> what do you do when even when you get together a room of really deep thinkers about this subject, they can't agree about what transit's supposed to be doing? And, what, and how this affects the daily life of, of planning in a transit agency is that most of the people who come at a transit agency with their demands or needs or issues don't understand that if you actually just let the transit agency do its job, it would deliver most of those outcomes. It's not always that easy. There are some, there are some tricks around the edges. But fundamentally, we're not allowed to focus on the fact that if we just do this job, a lot of these different goals end up getting met. So as a result, transit agencies tend to feel pulled apart by all these different people pr proposing different performance metrics. 
for what is in some cases really the same activity. So as I've thought about this a lot, you know, what, what happens again is I, I try to get at the core task or goal of transit, and I stand I get a list of its benefits. But those are a different thing. You don't need to have a separate action item for every benefit that you have. You're, you, you want to do a few, one or two clear things that everyone can focus on that all of these benefits flow from. And I sort of suggested, and I'm experimenting with this idea, that we might bring together the whole uh, essential task of transit with a term like abundant access, where um, what we mean is abundant access, access to the riches of your city, essentially, without personal vehicles, over distances too far to walk. Now, um, what, we've, what I've found is that that encompasses most of what everybody else wants. If you let us just do that, we will deliver a lot of these other outcomes. But um, it doesn't always cover everything, and there are some things that come into conflict with it. But a key thing, of why do I use the word abundant? It comes back to the notion of efficiency. And you will probably someday in your own careers have occasion to say that what somebody is proposing is just hopelessly inefficient. And that person will look back at you, and, and someone will look back at you and say, well, that just means you're a sexless, dead-hearted bean counter who doesn't understand beauty and goodness and the great city and all of those things, to which I always have to say back, no, there will always be some fixed budget, even if it's much larger than it is today. And whatever the fixed budget is, efficiency and abundance are the same mathematical concept. Right? They are the same thing if you are spending a fixed amount of money. So when we pursue efficiency, we are pursuing abundance. And you'll often hear me say, efficient and therefore abundant, or abundant and therefore efficient, because those are two words that have opposite valences. One sounds very, um, one sounds very cold, the other sounds very warm. They, they take you in opposite directions emotionally, so you always have to keep bringing people around to the fact that those two words mean this, exactly the same thing mathematically. Right? Um, <clears throat> By abundant access, I obviously mean not just more for me or for everyone, but the most abundance for the most people, which is why we focus on areas of high demand. We want to penetrate the population uh, as completely as possible. Without personal vehicles, when you're dealing with urban, with urban design and you're thinking about urban design especially, always remember that the genius of transit is that it takes a pedestrian and delivers her beyond her walking range as a pedestrian. Even a bicycle can be an encumbrance sometimes. And there's a tremendous kind of joy and freedom. What? Nope. Turn my phone off. It wasn't going off. Uh, that one, I turned that one off, actually. What do you think, Darren? Should be fine. Should have been fine. Yeah, OK, should be fine. All right. Um, um, so uh, this important idea that transit delivers a pedestrian beyond her walking range as a pedestrian. And um, over distances too far to walk. This is very important, and it's actually very controversial right now. Because there's a certain school of urban design thinking that says that transit is just moving too fast and that everything needs to be slowed down so that it is more intimate and works better with a pedestrianized environment. And this is an interesting conflict between uh, the notion that transit has to participate in a pedestrian environment in a way that inevitably slows it down a lot versus the reality that really, really slow transit ceases to compete with the automobile and also ceases to complement walking. It begins to compete with walking. The Portland streetcars, and I don't want to pick on the streetcar too much, but it's so close and it's so handy, uh, its average uh, scheduled operating speed across downtown is below seven miles an hour. Seven miles an hour, if you're not clear how slow that is, that's the minimum possible speed for cycling. That's the speed at which a cyclist can, below which a cyclist can no longer balance. That's extremely slow. Every time I'm on the treadmill, I think, okay, we're going to go up to 6.5 miles an hour here and race the Portland streetcar. Um, it's, um, 
This is the importance of a truly rapid transit that connects to it, that serves a pedestrianized area and then takes you very fast, way beyond the speed at which you could walk. And one of the interesting ideas that rises out of this, it's a very important idea for improving transit generally, is that people will walk further to faster service. First, they will yell at you when you tell them to do that, when you, when you, when you suggest that they should do that. First, they will yell and scream, but then they will do it. And um, before long, no one's complaining about it. So over distance is too far to walk. This is transit synergy to walking, and it's a key to efficiency and hence abundance. Now what's outside this circle? What do we get that really, uh, uh, what are people asking for that really conflicts with the idea of just providing abundant access? Well, there are a few things. Um, in the social justice, social inclusion kind of territory, um, some people who have needs for mobility live in very expensive to serve places. And um, uh, the, I'll give you a simple example. Not long ago, when the Federal um, Housing Administration had policies about senior citizen residences, and their policies were that you could get the most federal funding if you were locating your senior citizen facility in a rural location well outside of town. Because, as we all know, the only thing senior citizens want to do is sit on a bench and listen to the birds. And no, in fact, senior citizens are a very diverse bunch of people, and they want all kinds of things. And, uh, and this becomes also a spectacular way to create a tremendous transportation problem for seniors, which ultimately leaves them feeling trapped and frustrated. Um, and I've dealt with plenty of situations where the senior center has been built, you know, three miles out of town and down along cul-de-sac, and then they call up the transit agency and says, where's our bus? And well, the, in the future, the answer needs to be, you need, we needed to talk about this before you built that down there. That's the only way we're really going to get past those kinds of problems and toward the, the possibility of running an efficient and therefore abundant transit service. Um, there's the, when it comes to su support for sustainable urban form, an abundant transit system does that across a large area, but of course, many people want something quite specific for their particular favorite place. And so we get the demand for specialized services and also for expensive technology choices that aren't really related to demand. We get something that I broadly call symbolic transit. Symbols of mobility rather than actual provision of mobility. Or, or, or spending money on the symbolic quality at the expense of the actual. Fun, yes. Um, services used mainly as pleasure and recreation. This is a great mistake. This is, a, this is a very common mistake in transit planning and in transit journalism especially, is that you go to some other city and you ride its transit services and you think they're wonderful and you think you want to bring that home. And the problem with this, and a lot of technologies have spread around the world through exactly this dynamic of transit tourism, but the problem with transit tourism is that when you are in another city, you are a tourist, and that means you have entirely different objectives than when you're getting around at home. And so highly touristed cities like San Francisco or Sydney have these services that are very specifically focused on creating a fun experience for tourists. And, but if you don't remember that that's what they are and try to bring them home, you'll often find they're incredibly disappointing when you bring them home and try to use them to actually get around. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could spend five minutes talking about all of the ways that the San Francisco cable car, despite being beloved, uh, is actually just extraordinarily inefficient, extraordinarily slow, and among other things, one of the most dangerous forms of transport, public transportation out there, because of course the way you protect these historic cars is to wrap them in, in the flesh of the customers, so that if there is any sort of collision, the car is okay and you just lose the customers. Um, this was, has always been part of the design, and it's actually, frankly, a sort of fact of life about the 19th century, just where these cars come from, just as it's kind of a fact of life about some of the developing world. But this is interesting. Um, what if we could actually see our own access? What if everybody could see their own access? This is a little tool that is hidden in beta inside walkscore.com. Um, they don't really have the resources to develop it properly but I think it's actually an, a gateway to some really powerful ideas. 
Um, this is a simple tool where you plunk your pointer down in, and you select a departure time, and it gives you isochrones, blobs showing how far you can get in 15, 30, 45 minutes in, on transit plus walking. Okay? So you can see the sort of how it follows out the paths of the light rail lines and the other kinds of connections, and, um, um, and then how those spread out into walk paths and so on. Now, um, one of the obvious uses of this tool is that you can move your dot around and see the consequences of choosing to locate in a particular place. And this is incredibly important for the next generation of thinking about land use, which, which especially happens down at the face of the real estate transaction, where we ultimately are going to have to make sure that people understand the transit consequences of where they're choosing to locate or where they're choosing to build something. And the creation of simpler kinds of policies and explanations that can help make that clear um, are one of the things I work on. But um, you also need to, uh, 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 and, and so you know, if, if, if for example I was considering locating an office in downtown Portland, as opposed to out in the east side grid, I can see how my mobility options and how my specific access would change, and also how it would change if I chose to put an office out in a leafy suburb like the Vermont Hills. Now that's very useful to help people visualize and to have it presented in specific geography so that they're not just, this isn't just telling you, this isn't telling you don't locate in the Vermont Hills. This is telling you it, if you locate in the Vermont Hills, understand these consequences of doing that. And one, once you understand those consequences, that, uh, you should have every right to locate there. Um, but, uh, but also you can look at these maps in terms of what mobility is value, f uh, you particularly value, what access you particularly value, what parts of the cities you particularly need to get to. Now, this is really important for the whole problem of helping people take responsibility for their locations. But it is also gives us a sense of, what abundant, of how abundant access might be described, which it is basically the process of expanding these blobs so that people can get to more and more of the riches of their city in a way that feels easy. I said on an earlier slide, this is a map of freedom, quite literally. Because when, when we bring the concept of freedom into transportation, it's about the freedom to go now, get there, do things, access the city. And, um, and, and these are beautiful as maps of freedom, because these aren't telling you, these aren't for planning one trip. These, were for, these are for seeing in, at once the shape of your freedom, how far you can go, what, what's available to you readily. And so I think that these maps have the potential to connect with some fairly strong ideas that are out there in the culture of things that people value. And, um, but I want you to know one, one other thing in passing. This whole tool assumes that even more important than you, even more than you like your favorite transit technology, you like getting where you're going. And so it assumes that you're interested in getting where you're going and will use any transit technology that is part of the network that gets you there. And obviously that's based on assumption that all the transit technologies in the network, including the buses, are at a decent level of civility where, um, you know, where, where you feel welcomed and comfortable, everyone feels welcomed and comfortable using them. One of the interesting things that this line of thought does is it immediately leads you to wider stop spacing. There's a North American habit, it is purely a habit, that consecutive stops on a local service, bus or streetcar, should be about every eighth of a mile, about every 600 feet. You go to Europe, you go to, um, uh, you go to Australia, you go to New Zealand, and they have a different habit. And their habit is a stop should be about every quarter mile. About, uh, so about half as many stops. And again, the principle is people will walk further to faster service. The process of taking out stops is extraordinarily fraught. Politically, you know, um, you know some, everybody who's comfortable with that stop goes and talks to all their neighbors. And before you know it, the fact that you've inconvenienced one person causes 17 people to show up at a city council here. And so, this sort of, and so that's why it's very important to approach this from a policy level to say, here is what the consequence of changing stop spacing everywhere. Here is how much the whole system speeds up. Here are the access consequences of that. Here is how much faster you get where you're going. Um, now what's abundant access made of? I'll give you a quick taxonomy of this. If you're just focused on helping people get where they're going, what you want is a network 
of routes or lines, and if you want, we can go back to the process of choosing between those two words, that the five big quantifiable variables that you care about, frequency, span, speed, reliability, and capacity. Now, what's interesting, does technology choice matter at all to these things? Remember, people have these incredibly strong associations with certain kinds of technologies, that this feels fast, you know, a bus feels slow. But in fact, um, surprisingly, little of uh, uh, surprisingly little of our outcomes in these areas are actually related to technology, and let me just talk through quickly the ones that are. If you want extreme frequency and span, and you really want this to be, um, you, you really uh, are willing to spend a lot of money on capital in order to get extreme frequency and span, then what you want is a driverless rapid transit service. Remember, about 60 to 70% of operating cost is labor. So the thing that makes frequency so expensive when we have one employee on every vehicle is employee time, right? Which doubles inevitably as we double frequency. It's a quite direct relationship, kind of an iron law. We're stuck with it. The only way we break out of it is to not have one employee on every vehicle. And that's what Vancouver SkyTrain does and similar technologies that are used in other places. Now, the brilliant thing about this is I have commuted on this thing. And it's a totally different sensation than being even on, on Max Light Rail or BART, for example, in the Bay Area, where you always know that if you stay too late after work, the trains are going to get more and more infrequent. And, and certainly, if you try to go out and have any kind of nightlife, you're going to come out and you're going to be dealing with trains that run every 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And you're going to be stuck where you don't want to be for a long time. This thing runs every three minutes at 11.45 PM on a Tuesday. Because why not? You just turn it on, you turn it off. Frequency isn't really driving cost very much, so it just runs frequently all the time. So frequently that you experience it very much like an elevator. In fact, it's more reliable than elevators. You know exactly when it's going to come. And uh, it's always coming when you need it. This kind of frequency is freedom. And this is one way that technology does purchase a measurable outcome in getting where you're going. But the other big one is capacity. If you need more to carry more than about 60 to 100 people per driver, you want some kind of larger vehicle, right? MX, with its articulated buses, comfortably carries 100 people and comfortably carries a little bit more. But if you need to carry 300 people per driver, you want something like that. And that's got to be on rails. So that's one of the main reasons that we ultimately go to light rail. And when you look at European tram systems, many of them include this kind of capability for an enormous tram. That thing carries uh, well over 300. Um, because, uh, to, because that's a place where rail technology really is generating a, a, a meaningful result, right? Lots of people carried with one driver, therefore very efficient, therefore very abundant, right? But what is very hard to convey to people, <laughs> what people just cannot, will not believe, is that speed has nothing to do with technology. We're so used to the idea that speed is a feature of the technology. And in urban transit, it simply isn't. Um, speed and reliability in urban transit are about how long you spend stopped and what can get in your way. So it's an, um, when you look, for example, at MX, and you compare that with what a light rail vehicle would do, operating in exactly the same infrastructure, making the same stops with the same fare policies and everything else, it would be basically the same speed. It would be basically the same reliability. Why would it be different? In fact, buses have a reliability advantage over rail, too, which is that they go around little disruptions that happen that rail can get trapped behind. So it's very important to remember that speed and reliability aren't about technology at all, really. Different in intercity transit, but in urban transit, that's really the case. Now, when we think about these five, these five are all absolutely essential. They're like parts of the body. You can't just sacrifice any one of them. So it's interesting to think about which of these is so expensive that it requires a constant effort to justify and support it. Certainly not speed, reliability, or capacity. These require one-time time investments to create the facilities that deliver those things, but then they save operating cost once you've, once you've created them. But except when driverless, Frequency and span are direct linear relationships to operating cost. You double the frequency, you've doubled the cost. You run twice as long, you've doubled the cost. 
There's no getting out of that as long as there's one employee on every vehicle. So frequency and span need a particular kind of rhetorical attention that I don't think they usually get. But here's another one. Which of these is the hardest to grasp for somebody who just never uses transit? Remember, even a lot, you know, even though our city councils and boards are mostly full of well-meaning people who really want transit to succeed, many of these people are themselves motorists. Um, some of them may be cyclists. They don't, they, aren't they don't necessarily have the experience of how transit in particular actually works and why it's different from all those other modes. Um, well, it's very easy for me to explain speed, reliability, and capacity because those translate pretty clearly into motorist's experience. Span is easy to explain by analogy to the opening and closing of shops. Yes, things start up, they shut down. But it is immensely hard to get uh, a, a habitual motorist to really get frequency. They can get the mathematical concept. I can, they, they'll understand what I mean mathematically by what frequency is, but how to get them to get what it's like. And I finally ended up saying that, uh, I finally came around to, 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 to saying, okay, imagine that at the end of your driveway, there's a gate that only opens once an hour. And then they start to get it. Because then you start to realize, wait a minute, I, if I want to get somewhere now in my car, I'm not as concerned about buying a faster car or about having them build faster roads. That's much less important than getting this gate to open more often, right? In terms of how fast I'm actually going to get anywhere. And so that's a way to kind of turn that fundamental reality of frequency, frequency which means waiting, into something that almost anyone can understand. Because we have this problem that frequency and span are invisible. We are so visual now, you know, um, that we're passing around all these photographs on the web that don't even have captions anymore, you know. We don't even need to have, uh, to, to put text around our photos. The photos just go off and do their own things. And photos generate all these feelings about transit. And I can't take a picture of frequency. It's missing from that whole way that uh, dimension of communication. So that's why I ended up with this, the, you know, the imagining the gate. And yet, okay, here's a slogan that you can remember because it alliterates, frequency is freedom. If, you're, if you have an intention to begin a trip, the measure of how free you are to do that is the frequency of the service, right? That's going to tell you when, the, when, you're, when you're actually going to go. And until you can actually go, you're going to feel captive, constrained, right? Um, so, but, so frequency is the essence of all these great outcomes. It's more important than, than speed, often in determining local trip time. And frequency-oriented network planning has to start with the frequency rather than the network. And, that, and I'll come back to why that is. But because frequency is so expensive, deploying it is really transit's hardest task. And it's also something that I desperately need urban designers to understand because the current generation of reigning urban designers mostly are clueless about this. That you need to do, if, if you want transit to be part of a great urban space, it has to be, you have to be thinking about frequent transit. You have to be thinking about abundant transit, and remember abundant means also efficient. You have to care about those things. Um, because if you're able to buy that kind of extreme frequency, Frequency is buying things like spontaneity and freedom and empowerment and getting on with your life, which the people inside your development when it's all done are probably going to value. I was just at the Congress for the New Urbanism, and it's always funny listening to when, when urban designers think they're in an echo chamber with other urban designers and nobody else is listening because you, you start to realize that in this profession there can be this extraordinary sense of confidence about we understand exactly how this is all going to work. Because after all, the little pastel people in your model, right, they're all doing just what you want them to do. But of course, that's not what they're going to do in the real world. What they're going to do in the real world is want spontaneity, freedom, empowerment. And that's why it comes back to working with transit that can be frequent uh, and all that that implies. What's the opposite of abundance? Um, a couple of opposites, but I want to talk briefly about specialization and about what I'll call symbolic transit. By which I mean services that add little or no mobility or access to the network, but that are appealing either to special demographics or to non-transport purposes. 
Special amortization around demographics happens at both the high end and the low end, and I'll give you an example. Um, recently, uh, actually at this very dinner that I was telling you about with some leading people in Vancouver, one leading, uh, you know, one very prestigious academic said flat out, but I won't ride buses. Um, I'll, own, I'll ride trains, but I just wouldn't ride buses. As though that was the reason why we shouldn't invest in them. Um, it reminded me a little bit of another experience I had many years ago presenting a transit plan to a uh, transit agency board in suburban Southern California, not the LA Metro, but one of the agencies around it. And one of the people on the board who was from some suburban city council looked at me and said, so Mr. Walker, if we approve this plan of yours, does that mean I'm going to leave my BMW in the driveway? And I hope I said something civil, but obviously what I was thinking was no, actually. Um, we, if you have a BMW and if you love it enough that you needed us all to know that right now, then no, you're probably not going to leave your BMW in the driveway. You're probably going to continue driving it. And you know what? That's fine because there aren't very many of you. That was my same response to this academic who said, I won't ride buses. And my response was, I don't care. There aren't very many of you. You're an elite. Right? And the elite, and we constantly have to be reminding the elite that their personal experience is actually not that relevant because they're an elite. <laughs> there aren't that many of them. And they need to be listening more broadly, you know, to a more average kind of customer. And of course, the other thing is they need to be listening to their children because uh, generation, the generational difference is so profound. I mean, it's almost like gay marriage in terms of how dramatically uh, opinions about all this stuff are differing by age. Um, so, um, so we need to, def I, I'm very focused on the idea that transit needs to be civilized rather than premium. That because it needs to be abundant and therefore we can't be spending too much on any unit. Um, the, um, the other inter interesting, uh, an opposite example is specialization around the low end. Um, the 305 story. Um, we learned uh, um, uh, about uh, last year, the New York Times had a study had a big article about a single bus route in Los Angeles. It was called the 305. And the reporter, Jennifer Medina, told a story about the fact that this route is going to be cut. And of course, she went to Los Angeles and she rode the bus and she interviewed all these poor people who ride the bus and who, of course, said, said terrible, terrible things about how difficult their lives are and how much harder it will be if this bus route is cut. The problem with this bus route is that it runs directly from Watts to Beverly Hills. Now, if you know anything about Los Angeles, you know that as soon as you say this bus route runs from Watts to Beverly Hills, the assumption is that we're now going to have a conversation about race or class. Watts is the, is the epitome of a poor black neighborhood. Beverly Hills, obviously, the epitome of an extremely wealthy white neighborhood. And a bus going from one to another is presumed to be about poor black people going to work as maids and domestics in rich people's houses. Um, and so. Uh, this reporter told this whole race and class story around what it meant for a transit agency to cut a line that was associated with such a fundamental human need. Problem was, that's what the line really is. It zigzags across a high frequency grid. So these blue lines are very high frequency services that run north, south, and east, west. It's very easy to transfer from one to the other at any sort of junction point, right? And this is the way everybody else gets from Watts to Beverly Hills, is to ride a bus up and ride a bus over, or to anywhere else in LA for that matter. But there was going on top of it this zigzagging line that only ran every 40 minutes, which meant if you just missed it, it's, not the, it, it, you know, it's much faster to take the grid lines than to wait for another one of these. It's not, therefore, even reliably the fastest route between Watts and Beverly Hills. It's, it is, however, such a potent symbol that even though it is almost completely unnecessary in terms of getting anyone where they're going, nobody can quite cut it. So this is an example of symbolic transit. It has, is carrying some other symbolic weight that causes it to keep operating even though it really doesn't make any sense. Another way to critique this route is to observe that Watts and Beverly Hills are both very big places and one bus route will only go, go through parts of them. And everyone else going from other parts of Watts to other parts of Beverly Hills is on the grid anyway. So this is rather, the route is arbitrary too, and to, for to whom it, it delivers this little bit of extra mobility. 
One-way split, splits can be symbolic transit, right? The way, um, uh, this is wonderful. You'll hear sometimes urban designers say, well, we need the two directions of service further apart so that they activate more land area, more development area. I've actually heard developers say this many times. And sometimes intentionally put oncoming directions of service two or three blocks apart for that purpose. But of course, if you're, th if you're thinking like that, then moving the, the lines further apart makes them look like more lines on the page, makes it look like you're covering more area, right? But if you actually know how transit works, you understand that as you move the lines apart, you're actually reducing the area that's being covered because you have to be able to walk to both directions of service in order to be able to use the service in either direction. So the actual utility of the service, which is the pink areas here, is shrinking as you move the lines further apart. Yet as you do that, the lines appear to cover more area to, and if you're, if you're only interested in the symbolic outcome, which is a lot of what actual market development marketing is, then yes, it will seem to spread its, its goodness, whatever it is, over a larger area of development parcels. So that's a great example of, of a purely symbolic, symbolic kind of transit. So when we talk about specialization in symbolic transit, we're talking about reducing transit's abundance. Specialization of all kinds is when somebody says, oh, we need a route just for me or just for my suburb, or just for my development, or just for, for our travel pattern. Notice they're, they're specifically demanding service just for them. This is the essence, this is absolutely antithetical to what transit is, right? It is in the very nature of transit that great transit services are massively diverse and do many different things at the same time, serve many different people at the same time and are therefore not necessarily optimally designed around any one person's particular movement. Um, sometimes it's serviced by my sponsoring jurisdiction with my logo. In Los Angeles, we have this ridiculous spectacle that the LA had a very, very, has a very, very useful shuttle system downtown called the Dash, little buses running really, really, really frequently. Um, and, but, and this system worked really well downtown, but, but Los Angeles is in council districts. And so every council district had to have one. And so they took this product that's well suited to downtown and went out into neighborhoods that it wasn't particularly suited for and tried to figure out what to do with it. And inevitably, they asked the neighbors, and the neighbors said, oh, give us a little loop that goes around like this inside our neighborhood. Right? And so they made these little loops. You know, it goes to the senior center, goes around like this, goes through the shopping district, you know, around like that. And they all do dreadfully. They're all dreadful performers. Why? Because they go around in circles inside one neighborhood. No, great transit is transgressive. It's about cutting across those kinds of neighborhood boundaries. That's challenging for a city councilman, you know, because the usual way that city councils and districts work is, okay, you got your library last year, so I get my library this year. It's about sort of dividing spoils. And the na very nature of transit is to screw with that. Because no, you have to work across, you know, you're, you're, you're violating boundaries wherever you go in a good transit system. Um, and symbolic transit means services designed to represent abundant mobility rather than provide it. And I think you can say that about some premium technologies, and then you can certainly say that about, that about the example of uh, oncoming directions of travel move too far apart. I've gone a little while, I want to just talk through one really important business, which is be on the way. I was just at the CNU, at the Congress of the New Urbanism, and I said this there too. If you want a single rule for what makes a development potentially a transit-oriented development, it is that it is on the way between other potential high-demand destinations. The be on the way principle observes that what makes a really effective transit line is to have lots of major destinations along a single line that feels reasonably fast between any two of those destinations. That's what a subway is, of course. That's what any kind of really effective transit line does. So that's so ideal transit technology, uh, ideal geography for transit is geography that lets transit do that, right? The opposite, the perfectly toxic geography for transit is the cul-de-sac on any scale, where transit has to either bypass or deviate into the cul-de-sac, and if it deviates into the cul-de-sac, it destroys its market for everyone trying to go through. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, New urbanists and leaders in transit-oriented development have made this mistake, and I think many of them still don't get it. The early vivid example is Peter Calthorpe's Laguna West from 1989. This was one of the earliest uh, 
and, uh, ideas of a very standard, what we now recognize as a rather standard kind of new urbanist greenfield Todd, uh, the transit stop in the center, um, um, townhouses over retail around uh, in the first little bit of radius, density is gradually dropping away until it gets into single family. Yeah, this, uh, this development was laid out and, and began selling in 1992, and 20 years later it looks like this. Uh, the town center has never happened. Uh, only parts of it have been built, and this is basically a single family, car dependent neighborhood where all the streets are named for architects. And it's one of the great new urbanist failures, and unfortunately, I'm in the position of having to say, well, I understand there are lots of reasons why a development might, might fail, but this development is based on an elementary geometry mistake, um, which is that Peter thought he could put the town center wherever he wanted to look with, work with his development, and look where he ended up putting it. He's 15 miles south of Sacramento, and he puts it between two possible radial transit corridors, rather than on either one of them. Right? He's between I-5 and a railroad corridor. Either one of those could potentially, in the long run, be a straight uh, and therefore attractive line connecting a bunch of different destinations. And he chose to be in a, to locate in, in a place that's on neither one of them. He was assuming, unconsciously, that transit would simply deviate to serve him. And that is the arrogance of the cul-de-sac. The narcissism of the cul-de-sac is, I want only as much service as I justify all by myself which is another way of saying, I want service that's just for me, that will come right to me, right? It's that same kind of narcissism raised to the level of development plan that produced this kind of mistake. I'll talk briefly, too, about questioning the, the T, because this is another great example where urban design can really screw up transit. Whenever you have a three-point connection, when you, wherever you see transit lines coming together from three directions and seeming on the map to converge seamlessly, be a little suspicious because transit can't actually do that and you're probably being very subtly misled about what the actual service is. The reason for that, for example, let's take up, now that we've talked about a, a, a small mistake, let's talk about a cataclysmic multi-billion dollar mistake in the San Francisco airport BART extension, which extends south from San Francisco to the airport and also to a place called Milbrae, which is the gateway, the connection to a commuter rail that opens up all of Silicon Valley to you. Well, the, whatever, in an extremely politicized decision process, which included citizen initiatives telling the planners to design it this way, um, we ended up with building that infrastructure, that the line ends in a triangle. Um, and part of the problem is that for all of the motorists who were involved in this conversation, this looked fine, right? Everything was connected to everything else. If you're thinking like a motorist, that looks like a complete network, right? But transit doesn't work that way. The actual transit service will be one of those. You're going to either go to one point and then the other. So you'll go to SFO and then to Milbrae, and Milbrae will hate you. Or you'll go to Milbrae and then SFO, and, and SFO will hate you. Or you'll branch the service, in which case you're going to lose frequency, and you'll be running insufficient frequency to both SFO and Milbrae. Those are your choices. They're all bad choices, and that's because this is a bad piece of infrastructure. The, um, and it's funny because for about five years when I lived in Australia, I flew into SFO about once every year. And every time I did, I would take BART into the city. And every time I did that, BART was running this thing differently. It's like they were just squirming around in an uncomfortable chair. And the reality was they had bought the wrong chair and were never going to be comfortable in it. Um, so this is, this is why this issue about branching has to be very conscious. But I want to tell a positive story too, which is about the car-based commercial boulevard. And the beautiful thing about the car-based commercial boulevard is that while it may seem like totally hostile to transit right now, and it is uh, superficially, its underlying bones are excellent for transit. Remember what a great transit line is. It's a straight line, or feels like a straight line, connecting multiple major destinations such that it feels like a direct path between any two of them. Commercial boulevard is pretty good at doing that. And all you really have to do is civilize the boulevard. You have a design problem, which is much better than having an urban structure problem, like the problem that Peter created at Laguna West, which is one of the reasons why I'm very optimistic about the ability to civilize the commercial boulevard. And one of the ways I think we'll ultimately do that, uh, it's not going to happen until urban designers start respecting transit a lot more than they do. But once they do, you're going to start seeing the, the idea that um, you know, one of the interesting things is going to connect with something else I said earlier, which is that we need to move bus stops further apart. And if we can get bus stops spread out to a quarter mile, that becomes a reasonable spacing at which we can place crosswalks. 
One of the problems we have with putting stops so frequently is that frequently you'll see two, a stop, stops on two sides of the street with, with, where it's clearly totally unsafe to cross it. And there have been actually rather horrible litigation stories that have arisen out of accidents that have happened in that situation. And I ask a transit agency, if, why put stops there? Just pull them out. You're only serving one direction. Not only that, you may actually be encouraging people to do something dangerous. Um, put stops where they are accessible to both directions because you can't complete a round trip without using the stop on both sides of the street. You have to cross the street at some point. And if we had that quarter mile rhythm when we approach the commercial boulevard and organize the commercial boulevard around these quarter mile nodes, I think it would become, that would be, uh, that, that would be the, the key to a structure where then we can, or, the, everything else comes to gradually organize itself around that. So be, be optimistic about the commercial boulevard. It's actually great transit territory in terms of its underlying shape. So here, for example, is where we might end up in Los Angeles. And this may look a little bit like MX, and it should. But one of the other things that's, I think, coming down the line that we're seeing in Europe is buses of increasing transparency, such that more and more you feel like you get, when you get on the bus, you're still on the street. You're no longer crawling out of reality into a box to be transported. Rather, the bus itself is transparent. As much as possible, you feel that you're still on the street, part of the street life, while moving faster than you could walk. And the idea about the LA rapid buses, which might very well turn into this, is that they do stop only once every half mile, so they are reliably going much faster than anyone could possibly walk, and therefore complementing walking again rather than competing with it. That's what I have. Uh, I'd love to take some questions. Uh, you, uh, are you, are you going to have to come down to the mic, so you can walk around? With yeah, yeah. So come down to a mic. If you want to ask another question, come down to a mic and um, and sort of uh, wait there, and we'll talk. Hey, so are you working with the city of Los Angeles at all right now? And even if you're not, do you know what their most promising plans are at this moment? I know a fair bit about what's currently planned in Los Angeles. Uh, I don't currently have any contracts with LA Metro or the city of LA. Um, I use LA a lot because. Um, once, you get, once you really get the underlying geometry of transit, LA becomes a, a, a site of incredible potential because its underlying geography, the very reliable, evenly spaced grid, is so beautiful for transit, is so beautiful for, for the pr ability to provide, again, efficient and therefore abundant transit. Um, and Los Angeles, more or less, is, I think, moving on a very appropriate course. The, um, some of the most important lines they're developing now are, 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 are intended to work as pieces of that grid, most obviously the Wilshire subway, which will eventually run along the full length of Wilshire Boulevard, at least all the way from Los Angeles to Westwood, eventually Santa Monica. And that is a perfect example of a reasonably straight line that has so much stuff on it, so many different reasons for people to go back and forth all the time. So I'm very optimistic about Los Angeles, I think, and that's one of the reasons I probably talked about so far gone, you know, it will be really hard to train. You know, uh, as, as Robert mentioned, I, w I went to college in Claremont, which is 35 miles east of LA. And that was 1980 to 84. And I remember just the horrible sensation of landing at Ontario Airport and being like quite near the runway and not being able to see it yet um, because of the, such a thick layer of smog. And I remember the incredible stench of that smog and the process of getting used to it. And um, it has improved so much. Just the way that, for example, that California's emission standards that went in at that time over the course of the next 20 years dramatically improved the smog situation. So dramatically that, there is, there, that people are suddenly sort of feeling like LA, wow, okay, we can live here again. This isn't just something we have to bear down and, and suffer the way people in Chicago suffer winter. This is actually, you know, uh, uh, this is a great city. We got lovely weather and, and now we can actually see each other and we can see the horizon. Um, and, and that made a huge psychological difference to LA. Um, and then I think the reality too is it's, it's so funny, you know, nobody d d dares to just put to the voters whether we should like just take a lane on Wilshire. We have to have this incredibly inclusive process where we consult everyone for two years. And all that does is sort of 
complexify the issue to the point that we then have trouble feeling the confidence to move forward. You know, I, and, but then when you take polls in LA and you look at what people in LA want, their support for transit is astronomical. You know, everybody in LA knows that the car model has failed. I mean, nobody can pretend that, that the car-based transportation system is working. Uh, and so there's, actually, there's a surprising degree of consensus there about at least the big need to do something. And that translated into the vote on Measure 8 in 2008, which um, a huge sales tax increment that is meant to deliver all of these rail transit and bus rapid transit projects over the county. They're really going as fast as they can, and that's very impressive. Anyone else? Okay, um, my question was if a large development were to come in not within the network, the current network, mm -hmm. um, would you say t like tough, you, you don't get transit service um, because you should have built where it was more conducive to transit or would you say this is such a large market we have to serve these people? That, um, that's the question exactly and transit agencies agonize over it, it depends a lot. I mean, if it's something that it actually extends the urban fabric in a way that looks like it's going to improve the overall transit orientation of things, then you may have good reason to serve it. On the other hand, in most cases, um, new greenfield development of any kind generally isn't the thing that does that. Um, but of course, the new urbanists are out there. You know, I, I was flying into Houston yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, and we flew over so these endless suburbs of all the cul-de-sac obstructed streets and all of these subdivisions that are like two-thirds built and then lots of empty places where nobody's built houses or is likely to do now. And at one point we flew, on a, flew, across, flew across one of these and right in the middle of it, in the middle of the labyrinth where it would be very hard to get to, the, the new urbanists had clearly been there because there was like this big block of townhouses over retail and little gridded streets and all the things that they do but it was in a totally inaccessible place. And if I had been the transit agency, I would have said no, no. Not, not just because you've done this nice little thing, it's still too expensive to get to. One of the nice ways to simplify this question so that anyone can basically understand what transit efficiency is about in those situations is to ask, how far do we have to drive to get to serve 1,000 people? And if you're driving down Franklin Boulevard, the answer is probably 200 feet. And if you're driving down uh, inner West 11th, the answer may be, you know, a quarter mile. And then if you're driving out to Cottage Grove, the answer may be 10 or 15 miles. And that, and also you can understand then that if the street network is conducive to people walking out, you're serving more people as you go by it than if the street network is obstructed. You can count that in. And you can also count, capture the impact of uh, the needing to cross big ga gaps of empty space in order to get to something. Calgary recently had to deal with a new, highly transit-oriented, very nice gridded little new urbanist community that happens to be five miles northeast of the edge of the existing city. And of, as usual, the developer came to city council and said, we're doing this wonderful new urbanist sustainable thing. We have these great lead standards. We're meeting all these great lead standards on our buildings. We're doing green this and green that. Of course, you're going to serve us, right? And um, Calgary had the, had the courage to say, no, it's lovely, but it's in the wrong place. And, um, and someday the city may grow out to it and it may make sense, but no, it's way out there and we have to cover a huge distance to get to it. So the deal had to be that the developer was going to subsidize the service. Usually the way that deal is done is that the developer subsidizes the service for two years. In other words, until the developer's gotten out of town and then it um, flips back and then suddenly the city has to pay for it. But they did it more cleverly. They said the developer and or the homeowners association will continue to subsidize this service if they want it until such time as it reaches this ridership threshold, a threshold that it is simply not going to, going to meet until the city along the way has built in. So those are the, some of the ways you deal with that. Um, but it has to be about, yes, the nature, when you're talking about greenfield extension, it's about the nature of the density you're delivering there. It's about the nature of the walkability. It's also about whether the street network is a labyrinth for buses such that transit is going to have to drive around. Again, how far do you have to go to serve a thousand people if I have to drive around in circles because I'm driving through a labyrinth? That obviously counts against you. And then finally, do you have to cover a big rural gap? Those are all things, Val. 
Yeah, feel free to come down to the microphone if you expect to answer or ask a question. That's always a good thing to do. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Mm -hmm. This has actually brought up a lot of questions for me that have made me think and wonder if MX actually is the right solution. At this time, there are all the sea of sea issues. Mm -hmm. Everything with the land use that's happening out there, um, especially the kind of outer west land, the level of the red sea that exists, you know, do we want to provide the transit first or do we want to wait for more density to happen there? Tough question. Okay, now I'm going to be very careful here. Three minutes. Well, no, there's a bunch of disclaimers that are needed before I even touch this issue. Um, I don't work for LTD, although I have worked for LTD in the past. Um, I have a lot of friends at LTD. I generally think they're doing a fairly good job. Um, the, that, however, is not why I would express this view. The situation with MX at this point is complicated. It, we are not at the historical moment to have that debate, is basically my response. We are past that historical moment. We are so far past the point of deciding about whether this project should even go next, among all the other corridors that are being thought about for MX. And we're, pa and we're way past the point of redesigning the corridor anymore. And that has to do, frankly, with frustrating external factors coming in about the way the federal funding process works. And the reality being that if the project does not go ahead, not only are you handing money back to the federal government, but more importantly, you're actually um, putting a little bit of a black mark against your community with the Federal Transit Administration because they don't like it when this happens and they will be slower to approve the next thing. This, uh, th now, none of that is about what's right or good or beautiful. It's about what's real, right, <laughs> about how that process works. Um, I do have a critique, though, of the MX process, which is that it is very clear that it got way out ahead of where the city of Eugene was in terms of planning. Not just on the staff level, but also it got way out ahead of what the city, Eugene City Council could say confidently about what its intentions were. And so we got, um, the, and so, and that, you know, that I think went wrong pretty badly. And one of the things I would say the next time you do an MX corridor is that LTD should refuse to pursue an MX corridor until the city is way out ahead of them, absolutely demanding it, right? Rather than just having this sort of tepid, well, yes, if you'd like to do this, well, we, that sounds kind of nice, and you know, and all of these sort of very narrow votes. And that didn't work. Um, nevertheless, we're now so far down the process that there are some very negative consequences to just canceling the project now. And so now the thought process has to be, you know, even if this project is flawed, can it make sense, flawed in some way, you know, even if we'd like to go back five years and rethink something, we can't. Uh, is it still useful enough? And does it, is there, are there ways to make it part of any um, future network uh, that, justify going ahead and proceeding with it, given that we are at this point. My view is, is yes, that it, that it does make sense to proceed with the project, um, even though it's not what I would have designed, um, but because I think I, I can visualize a future network in which it works very well. Um, but I would also say in the future, let's not do it this way. <laughs> you, know, let's, you know, let's get the city out front. And frankly, one of the interesting things now, of course, is that after this corridor, if, if, if LTD starts prioritizing based on what the cities are excited about, the next two corridors will be in Springfield. Out Main Street to Thurston and from, and from Springfield down to LCC. And you will have a grand cross-shaped regional network whose center is downtown Springfield. And that will be a legitimate, logical result of the political process in Eugene, <laughs> at some level, that Eugene hasn't been coming at this with a sufficient level of exuberance to, to be able to deal then with the inevitable local objections and ride on through, and also, of course, be out there with exciting land use plans. Um, you know, fact is, right now, West Eugene looks like it's just sort of stuff dribbling off into space, and there isn't that big outer anchor, the Gateway Mall, the kind of destination, the LCC kind of destination that assures us we're going to fill buses all the way to the end of the line. 
And so that, the, the, the challenge, I know there are intentions to create that out there, but um, you know, it certainly would have been easier if, if there had been more exuberance about and more confidence about that. Yeah? Okay. I mean, that's, that's the huh? obvious, obvious question. Maybe it's too short of a corridor. Sorry? Is, is not really too short of a corridor to look at bus rapid Yeah, there is a problem of corridors being too short. But bus rapid transit uh, needs to have a certain relatively high or average trip length so that its speed is valuable. If you're going really short distances, remember, frequency matters more than speed. You'd probably do better just turning up the frequency on your on your local service, right? It's part of the trade-off. Yeah, do you have one? Okay. With private property, mm -hmm. and that is one of the big issues going on with EMX right now, um, and with any development of anything. How do you deal with that? I mean, I feel that one of the big mistakes made in this town and in a lot of places is nobody goes out and makes a survey and spends $100,000 asking all of the businesses, uh, the property owners, the business owners, the residents, what their feelings are about more transit, uh, what, their, uh, what their needs are, what their future plans are. See, the planners, the urban planners just say, hey, we're gonna go do this. Well, this guy's had this business here for 50 years. Okay. He's gonna pass it on to his grandson. Well, let's talk about So that. how are you gonna deal with all that? Let's See, talk and about now, I don't that. think that's an issue that's ever brought up in an urban planning class that needs to be. It's actually an example of something that I talked about here, which is that inevitably, transit has to be designed at a certain altitude in the context of a particular urban structure, right? The need to connect certain dots, the need for this network to work in a, in a coherent way is going to lead to the need to run down this street instead of that one. People who own property on that street are not the only stakeholders. Anyone who values having a complete and coherent transit network is a stakeholder in that question. Very few great transit projects would have been built if the decision process had been based on surveying the current property owners along the line. I'll give you a simple example. When the east side Burnside segment of Max was being constructed, or was being planned and promoted, I distinctly remember having TriMet produced a video of Max coasting very smoothly through these very comfortable, all single family, low density areas along Burnside. And the message of that was, Max will not bring any development. Max won't change your property values, it'll just get through here and not bother you, because, but it has to get through here because it needs to get to Gresham, right? What actually happened, of course, it, and, and that was a response to what people felt along the line at the time, right? But what actually happened, of course, is that Max got built, the stations opened up, property values exploded around the stations, and people were quite eager to sell their single family homes to be replaced by apartment buildings. That, uh, and, and many of the people who thought this was going to destroy their lives actually came out quite well. Now, the measure, is the, though, is not whether they came out well. The point is, you know, that Max line had to operate somewhere there because it had to get to aggression. You know, these East Burnside stations are not why we built the Max line. So, and there was a larger regional compelling interest to get a, a, a light rail line from Portland to Gresham that frankly was um, quite appropriately should not have been vetoed simply because people living immediately along the line at that particular time didn't like it. Transit history is full of stories of neighborhoods that have rejected transit and learned to regret it. Talk to anyone in the Georgetown district of Washington, D.C. Um, you know, there, there are lots of stories about that. And once transit goes in, you get a very different response and a very different experience. One more person, right? Yeah, the last question. Something that's appropriately sized to its capacity requirement. So BART 
has 10 car long stations. And it does that because during the peak and increasingly during the midday, it, need, it, it is running 10 car crush loaded trains under the bay. And that's fantastically efficient. You're moving 1,000 people per driver, right? And again, ratio of passengers to drivers. Magnificent efficiency, therefore abundance, right? Again, it's a matter of, so it's appropriate sizing to the capacity. But if you don't need a vehicle, you don't need, if you don't have the demand to carry more than 100 people per driver, there's no reason to go to rail from, from access or, or mobility terms. There's no reason to go to rail in terms of, of, of achieving abundant access. You may do it for symbolic reasons, or you may do it for other performance measures uh, external to actual transit. But when it comes to the sheer process of making transit efficient and therefore abundant, that's what it is. And that's why BART is right for where it is, but would be overkill in Portland, let alone Eugene. It's why Max is right for where it is, but would probably be overkill in Eugene. Um, and that's the sort of thought process that really leads us there. Sure,